What up, peeps? Thursday, June 8th, 1 p.m. on the East Coast. This is Market Call. I'm Guy Adami. That's Dan Nathan. I got this little cool undershirt going, but that's cool. probably for another show. Uh, in just a few minutes, and I promise a few, Elizabeth Young, that would be EY from SoFi, will be joining us. And, of course, get ready, people, the one word we all look forward to on Thursday, butters, because that's what I do. Today's Market Call is brought to you by Dan SoFi. Get your money right all in one app. And, of course, our data partner is FactSet, financial data and analytics powered by tomorrow. Dan, when you go to a hotel, um, which we often do when we travel for work and those types of things, what do you do? You put that thing on the door if you want, like the the, the housekeeper. It's housekeeping, right, to come in? Yeah, yeah, you put the thing on the door, the little yeah, sign. Yeah, it says makeup. So we have a housekeeping note. Dan, would you like to tell the people it's housekeeping? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Our Monday market call is going to go to noon. It's going to be on live on Sirius XM radio Stop here. It. It's going to be really exciting. We're going to take your calls. A lot of you guys who tune in for us here at 1 p.m. Monday through Thursday. Uh, on Mondays, you're going to be able to call into Sirius. And here's the deal. Look at that. Business Channel 132. That's the mm. business channel. Um, and it's going to have a radio feel. It's going to be totally, totally different than what we do here. So check it out, people. Um, there's a link that Amanda and Jacob are going to throw in there. Um, and you can see, look at that. Look at that wow. right there here, people. And also check us out on the Twitter because there's a link there. If you don't have Sirius, I don't know why you don't have Sirius at this point, but you can get three months free. So check it out. You can call in. You can talk to Guy and myself live. We can talk markets. We can talk the economy. We can talk about maybe a little sports stuff, maybe a little music. And we also want to thank our good friends at Roman. We have a new presenting sponsor on the Risk Reversal Media family. That would be Row. I've been on the Row Body uh, program. So you're going to hear more of that across our platforms here, but they're going to be presenting sponsor of our portion of the market call on Sirius XM Radio. Well, that is that housekeeping. Too. That's a yeah. thorough housekeeping. That's like you even cleaned underneath the toilet and stuff. You know, All right. You hey, like, guys, speaking of, of no, cleaning. I'm just saying, you got to do here. that when you clean on this, this your board. look. It, it, you look like a Russian sailor. So, and don't go to the Urban Dictionary for that. Like, like seriously, like what is that look? Isn't that what the Russians, don't they have like the striped yeah, shirts? I, well, having never been a Russian sailor, it's hard for me to right, sort guy, of. Because we got a lot to, poetic about we that. got a lot to do. Although today. I did see a hunt for Red October, so I guess that qualifies me. Yes, it does. Um, we got Liz, we got Butters, but you and I got to go through some stuff here because yesterday I was out of pocket all day, and it was one of the very few days when the markets opened um, in, in, in of of recent note where I have not been paying attention um, at all. Deepest thing you can do. Uh, yeah, and you know when I looked at the end of the day, I pulled up my fact set machine and I looked and see how the market traded a little bit and it was interesting because the S&P was just fine. Uh lots of parts of the S&P were just fine. The Nasdaq was down. There's not something there, there was not something now the Nasdaq was only down one and a quarter percent or something like that. But then I looked at some of our favorites. I looked at Google and Amazon were down more than 3%. Microsoft was down 3%. Apple was down less than 1%. Nvidia was down 3%. Mm -hmm. And I was like, whoa, if you told me all of that, right? At the end of the day, I would have thought we had a really, really bad market day. day and we didn't. And then look at today. And so maybe we could pull up the NASDAQ, like a three-day chart here. You can see what happened in just a short period of time. Uh, and then today I'm looking at NVIDIA is up 3%. You know, Interestingly, Google's unchanged. Amazon's up 2.8%. Microsoft's not up a whole heck of a lot. And then this Tesla outlier, this thing is absolutely killing me. I'm actually laying into this thing, guy. I have literally been kind of hands off the last few weeks, I cut the position after earnings, after it came in a lot. Um, I still had a short position. It's up by you know what, but today's the day. I'm just kind of leaning in. There's the NASDAQ. That's the three-day chart. Um, here's the thing. What if it's kind of a one step forward, two steps back guy? Can that get the NASDAQ to correct that sort of thing? That is that is a line from uh, the Bruce Springsteen. Yeah. I, I want to say solo album. It wasn't with the E Tunnel Street at that point. Tunnel, Tunnel of Love. Love. Yep. Um so, yes, it could be. But again, you know, I think the point you made many and there were a few salient points. But the one that I really took from was if you had told me all those things, all those stocks were down the amount that they were and then said, all right, where's the S&P off a day like that? I would have said it's down 75 handles easy. And obviously that didn't happen because yesterday was a huge rotation day. Now, today, in large part, seems to be a, not only say a complete reverse of yesterday, but obviously some of these things are bouncing back. So it doesn't make a whole hell of a lot of sense to me at all. But to answer your specific question, 
Could it be sort of two steps down, one step forward? Yeah, it could be. We could be on the brink of something for sure. And more and more people seem to be coming to the realization that we are stretched on a number of different metrics, uh, not least of which valuation, but others as well. I mean, the, those bull bear reports that we talk about all the time, yeah. they're probably as skewed as they've been over the last year or so. So people are all geeked up and maybe correctly so, but, you know, personally, I don't see it. And I take, you know, I get in trouble for pronouncing this gentleman's name incorrectly. So I'm going to be very slow when I do it, but Stan Druck and Miller yesterday was talking about the potential for a 15 to 20% earnings decline over the next year or so. And I'm in his camp and I don't think, and he has said it as well. I don't think the market is fully priced in the lag effect of what's going on in terms of the Fed. And whether the Fed moves next week or not, I don't even think it matters. Any point. Danny Moses talks about this. Fed's a bit of a sideshow now. Yeah. And, you know, the one thing about Drucker Miller is kind of interesting. We talked about it a few weeks ago when he said he's all in on this AI thing and NVIDIA. And I think in those comments, he also said that you can be long NVIDIA for the next couple of years here or whatever. Yeah, okay. Maybe. Maybe, but I, I just remind you that, and we all learn, you know, Stan is a billionaire and he's considered one of the most successful um, investors of this generation. But, you know, they got turned around when he was at the Soros Fund in the late 90s. They were short tech and then they got super balls long tech um, right before the all time highs. And then they ended up losing multiples long of what they lost on the short side. So I, I guess my point is, is like he's talking about this earnings drag. He's talking about, you know, an earnings recession that we're going to be in. You know, look at just Microsoft. Look at NVIDIA. Look at Adobe. Look at Google. Look at, my, you know, like any any of these names that are benefiting from this craze right now. They have pulled forward a lot of optimism, okay, about this newfangled technology and how they're going to benefit monetize, you know, like users or enterprise customers or whatever on their platform. So to me, if there's going to be a broad-based earnings recession. These companies have already pulled forward a lot a of the lot. excitement <clears throat> and the valuations are just really stretched. And I don't know how you have an earnings recession without multiple compression. And that would be the issue for me. So I don't think those two things can be, you know, this, I don't think they can live in the same. They don't line up. No, I'm with this and I'm completely with you. And the pull forward is where things could get really dangerous because if you have one, the pull forward, but then two, you have, a slowdown in an earnings recession, which is, I think we're on the precipice of, I mean, then you sort of get double dinged on those types of things. And then when valuation is a concern, which it clearly is, I mean, even the most ardent bulls out there have to say that we're stretched on valuation. Then you sort of have the trifecta of things that potentially could work against you. But for now, at least everything seems, seems copacetic. I don't know how to spell that. And I'm not even sure what it means, but that seems to be the environment we find ourselves in right now. So here we are, Dan. Here yeah. we are. Copacetic. Um, yeah, I couldn't do that either. Um, speaking of things that we don't understand, let's bring in Liz Young. That oh, is I understand. Why from so far. I'm gonna, and I'm just going to tell people, first of all, look at that backdrop, number one. Dope. You don't, don't understand me? You brought me in because you don't understand no, me? No, I totally get you. You I think are a mystery wrapped in a riddle. No, disagree. Surrounded by an enigma. Um, oh, wow. Hey, Liz. Like, these are just like rattling off compliments. I, no, know, I love I mean, it. I, I, listen, you know, you can speak for yourself on that one. I think I totally, I mean, you know, we've in this point in our relationship, which is now multiple years, Elizabeth, you know, I uh -huh. totally get you. Yeah. We're in a long-term relationship. Yeah. That's good. <laughs> oh, man. Oh. Well, you know, Liz, at guy's age, you want to be careful of committing for too, for too long. That's to true. Right. He buys one well, roll of toilet paper at a time. That's right. I've Liz. talked about it all the time. Well, I said it a couple of weeks ago. I said, wishful thinking. You want to know the definition? Go to Costco and watch those old <laughs> sons of bitches buying like, you know, 48 rolls of toilet oh. What the hell do they think's going on? What do they think's happening? And they load their basket up with all. I'm like, hey, you might want to go day by day here. But that's just me. I'm just saying. And I'm going to be in that. I'm going to be in that camp real soon. Yeah. Oh, you're not um, there yet. Okay. No. Liz, close. Help, us, help us make, um, you, you heard us talking about earnings recession. You heard us talking about some of these big billionaire, you know, successful investors who are all in on the AI trade, but they think that the lag effects and the earnings recession, and how can those, how can those two things work? And we're not talking about different caps. We're not talking about small caps. We're not talking about, you know what I mean? We're, we're, we're just talking about the things that have been driving the performance on the market this year. You have an S&P that's up 12%. You have a NASDAQ 100 that's up 
um, you know, 32 percent. Um, they're still, you know, well below their 2022 all time highs. Um, but how can both of those things be true? Right. Like, how can you have a stagflationary earnings recession, but the things that have powered and have gotten really narrow, you know, in the major indices, how can they continue to hold up on a relative basis? Well, one of them is going to end up being wrong. Um, and I think at least in the short term, or let's say over the next 12 months, and I, I think I mentioned this last week, the, the thing about this AI craze, first of all, the AI thing is a theme. People have invested in a theme, okay? Not necessarily a trading catalyst. It's looked like a trading catalyst over the last couple months and maybe year to date because of what's happened in the enthusiasm that people have bought it with. But in reality, it's a theme. And usually investing themes are things that you invest in over, let's call it a two to five year period, maybe even a five to 10 year period, depending on what it is. Something to compare that to if you wanted to invest in, let's say, a clean energy theme, right? That's not a situation where you would buy a company today and expect that the world has transitioned to clean energy by the end of this year. I think there's probably a mismatch in expectations of when people are going to get the gratification on that AI trade. So, They've gotten the gratification on buying the enthusiasm around this new theme and that it's going to completely transform the world. And, and it may transform the world, but it's probably not going to transform the world by December. So looking at what you're paying for some of those stocks and deciding whether or not it was a good trade by the end of this year might end up being a little bit frustrating. So they're investing in a theme. But how can they both work? They probably can't, frankly, especially with valuations as inflated as they are. So either it's a situation where an, a terrible earnings recession and another market correction actually doesn't materialize and we just sort of chug along in this range until we slowly find our way into a bull market. I don't think this is a new bull market yet. And yes, I'm excited about the small caps. I saw the comments about that. But either way, I, one of those things has to come back to earth in some way, shape or form. My bet is that the valuations in this AI trade are the ones that will come back to earth a little bit more, but there's still reason to believe that it's possible it's the other way around. The market in the last couple of days has tried to prove us wrong, so we'll see. We have a conversation on these shows, so we're going to have about to have another conversation. We talked about the Russell yesterday, the outperformance. Carter Worth actually did an entire 15, 20 minutes on sort of the ratio between the S&P and the small caps. So here's my one concern, Elizabeth, about the small caps. Now, I get that IWM has been bouncing and you had a pretty significant bounce yesterday. My concern, I guess, is so much of that bounce has been predicated on the move in regional banks. It's a large component right. of the Russell, our regional banks. Now, I guess it doesn't necessarily matter. But my question to you is, and I'm not sure there's an answer here, is that masking, is this rally potentially masking just a bounce in regionals before the next shoe potentially falls in terms of what's been going on there? Just quick thoughts on that. Yeah, no, this this is an important conversation because I know that I'm always the small cap bull and I am definitely long small caps in my personal account. So this recent bounce has been nice for me, but usually if you're if you're using small caps as a signal of cyclicality or really more a signal of early expansion behavior, you need the macro data to back that up. And it gets tricky because all the macro data is backward looking. But recently we saw services PMI tick back down to neutral. That's not typically a situation that you would expect to see in early expansion behavior. You've got PMIs on a downtrend rather than an uptrend. If we had PMIs in contraction, both services and uh, manufacturing, and they started to tick back up and small caps were taking off across sectors, that would be a signal for me that, all right, this is some, this is the beginning of something different, right? This is probably a little bit of an oversold bounce. Valuations have mattered. Looking at yields being reasonably sticky for the last couple months, valuations maybe are something that are triggering people to buy into some of these underloved sectors, underloved size categories. And then always remember what happened coming out of the 2008-2009 crisis Obviously, the sector that took us into that crisis was banks. It was financials. The one that bounced the biggest on the other side was also financials. So actually, the size category that led us out by a wide margin of that crisis was mid caps, because at that point, there were a lot of banks in the mid cap space. So this is a, probably a similar situation where it's like, OK, maybe that problem is solved. Perhaps it is. Maybe it's not going to be the next set of big headlines. And now we've got this kind of oversold bounce kind of rejiggering of portfolios and getting the exposure back to right-sized. 
I don't know that this small cap bounce will last as much as that feels like vinegar rolling off my tongue. I just don't think that the rest of the signals are lining up for it to be durable. Yeah. And, and, and I think that makes some sense. I mean, like, like from a technical standpoint, we just had the chart up. I mean, the support looked real down there and it's going to take some sort of um, event in my opinion. What, what I mean, like a macro event, like a, a, a shift, um, or, or something in the regional banks, you know what I mean, to kind of get it retesting those recent lows, but they will likely come, especially um, if it is led um, by like a broad based move in the major, you know, large cap indices. Ultimately, you know, I think the small caps, which might initially show good relative strength, will probably play, uh, play catch up to the downside. You know, so we have this Fed meeting next week, guys. And I just want to get like, like let, let's do a touch on yields here um, mm -hmm. because, you know, I kind of feel like. The, the, the 10 year, if we want to pull up a, a, a one year chart of the 10 year US Treasury yield, um, it really feels like it's having a tough time kind of working out above this kind of 3.8% sort of uh, zone. And I feel like everything that we've just discussed and, and really speaks to what we think is going to be a stagflationary um, sort of environment is probably not that bullish for like longer term yields, in, in my opinion, you you know, and and so then I want to flip this thing around. I want to look at the TLT, and this is one that we've talked about um, a little bit over the last couple of weeks. And we have a chart here, and and we just put a couple lines on this thing here, and this is going back to um, the start of 2022. And you know, I mean, the uptrend, okay, it's fine, it's mild. This uh, the downtrend is obviously fairly well pronounced. You see that 200 day moving average there. I really feel like this thing has the potential to break out. And you know, if you think about guy, you've been talking a lot about the volatility in the treasury market for a couple of years now. And it seems like we have kind of reached some sort of level where we've, we found some equilibrium and it really is an inflection point about what is the next big Fed move? We know that it was priced in just a couple months ago that the next big move were big rate cuts by the end of this year. Well, those have been pushed out now. Mm -hmm. So I just wonder here if we're going to start seeing yields on the 10 year start to push lower. The TLT is the iShares 20 year, okay, um, treasury ETF. I really feel like this thing has the potential to break out a little bit, especially if we see pressure on longer dated yields. All right. So let's talk about how that could happen and the reasons why. So Elizabeth mentioned some of the weakness we're seeing in a lot of this data, ISM data. I mean, everything suggests that things are slowing. The only thing that doesn't suggest that things are slowing down is the stock market, but things are clearly slowing down. So you have this sort of tug of war, I think, with the 10 year. And listen, it's playing out right before our eyes. The ranges continue to get more and more narrow. We're coming to this pennant. So the question is, what will take us higher in the TLT and lower in yields? Well, I think it's going to be continued weakness in the underlying economy, which is prevalent and clear, and a potential sell-off in the market where you do see a flight to quality in the form of bonds. So I think that can happen. But if, in fact, that does happen, what I think will then happen on the back of it is the yield curve will continue to invert because I don't think you're going to see a commensurate move in two-year yield. So if this plays out the way you think it will, Dan, I think TLT goes higher, 10-year yields go lower, two-year yields stay sticky. That yield curve, which is probably 75 or 80 basis points-ish, is going to push out to 1%. And then we're going to have a conversation as to what it means for the economy and what it means for the market. But that's how I see this playing out, Dan. Liz, what are your thoughts on yields? Well, I mean, obviously, there's a Fed meeting next week. We had the Bank of Canada just do kind of a surprise hike. And not that the Fed is going to take its cues from the Bank of Canada, but the inflation problem is obviously not solved around the globe. I think if we start to hear surprisingly hawkish messages, yields stay elevated for a while. And as long as the data keeps rolling in kind of inconsequential. I mean, yes, it's weakening, but there hasn't really been anything that has raised alarm bells yet. As long as that keeps happening, I think we're kind of stuck. And again, I, I don't remember if this was in the podcast on Monday or last week on Market Call, but this whole inversion, you know, the, the uninversion got me a little bit nervous, but now we've reinverted. It's not okay to just stay inverted like this. And it's possible that we will stay inverted for a while. And even if we just ignore the twos, tens, look at things like the three-month tenure, pretty inverted, the near-term forward spread, very inverted, right? All of these things would have to sort of right themselves before you could feel optimistic that we were headed in the right direction. I think yields are still sending the signal, and, and there's probably more possibility for the tenure 
yield to fall further because of fear, because I think we're all just kind of waiting and looking around the corner for that data that's going to be scary. But as long as there isn't a big signal, I think we're just sort of stuck in this same spot. Dan, yeah, before, I mean, Dan's going to get mad at me. I apologize, Dan. Yeah. And this, by the way, is going to happen a lot on the radio show. So buckle your freaking seatbelts. But when Elizabeth talks about inversion, now what do I think about? Of course, I think about Top Gun. I was inverted. Then I bullshit. <laughs> He goes, no, seriously, I got a great Polaroid of it. That's what I think of when. And then, and then, he, and then yeah. Deuce by accident flips the instructor of the bird. Yeah. I you know, didn't what, mean yeah. To do what were that. you yeah. doing at that yeah. inversion? Sorry. Uh, mm -hmm. What did he say? International relations. Bro. Yeah. I was flipping him the bird. I'm sorry. Yeah. I didn't know that it yeah, does. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. I'm sorry, Dan. I'm movies. sorry. One thing. I just, I'm not really sorry. Throw, throw that chart back up here. And, and again, you know, we, we just gave you a bunch of gobbledygook of why. No, it wasn't gobbledygook. No, 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 but I'm that just was well like, thought out stuff. No, well, it might, might have been, but like it, it could be wrong, too. And, and and that chart might like if you look at it, just like like what Liz is talking about is like the sideways action we've seen. We've seen the 200 day moving average really flatten out here and that thing could break. And if it breaks, that means that yields are going higher. And if yields are going higher and they're going higher as far as the 10 and 20, there's something that we haven't really contemplated. So I, you know, I want to be like, the charts are just one input. We can draw the lines. It can help you think about, you know, they, they kind of maybe, you know, reinforce your own view on it. But, you know, my view has been that I want to play for a breakout here. Um, you know, guy, you mentioned the bull bear stuff and, and our friend Helene Meisler, she had a, a tweet this morning. I, I only saw it because you guys showed it to me. I'm not on Twitter, um, but it was the AII um, bull um, up 15 points to 44 and a half highest since you ready for this guy. Yeah. November 10th, 21. That, I, I think that's ago. the exact day that the NASDAQ put in an all-time high. So I think that's worthwhile. All right. Going back to the, the point about the NASDAQ and what it did yesterday versus where we saw money flow to yesterday. And so let's let's pull up a crude chart. We have a three-day chart here, I think. Or and, and you look at this. This is so you you explained it to me because I was gone all day. I said, what the hell happened? You said they're just rotating. They're rotating out of the stuff that they've been buying hand over fist for two months now. And, and then they, you know. Uh, they bought the energy, but now it's down today. So, like, you look at this, and Liz, you spent some time in your note. Mm -hmm. um, battery low. <laughs> Liz looks at the energy sector. This would be on the SoFi Investing Blog, people. You can check it out. Let's throw up a screenshot of this bad boy here. Um, because why did this did, did this hit your radar yesterday because of the move we had in energy? Or, like, when did you start contemplating um, these thoughts on energy? And please, please explain to us um, how we should be thinking about the sector right here. Well, you just pulled up Helene and she's got a pinned tweet on her Twitter page that says nothing like price to change sentiment. So what hit my radar yesterday and the day before was all of a sudden everybody was excited. You know what? Energy's up. Cyclicals are up. It's over. We're done. And one or two days does not a trend make. So it's it started to hit my radar that, OK, price is up. People are getting enthusiastic. And look, it is great that breath expanded because last week, the week before, for probably a month or two now, I've been saying this is like you got a star player on the court. If he sprains his ankle, the other four need to be able to make up for it. We need to see other things participate. So these are good signs over the last week or so. You want to see these signs. You want to see other sectors come to play and you want to see other size categories come to play. So it is a good thing. The energy trade, though, when you look at obviously what happened in 2022, up 60% on the year. And then what's happened this year, there've been a few attempts for energy stocks to make a run and even oil prices to make a run and find some upside. And they've failed every time. They haven't been able to hang on to it, despite the fact that there are still tailwinds for the sector if it's driven by supply and demand. Supply and demand dynamics would suggest that oil prices should be moving higher. We got a little pop on that announcement by Saudi Arabia cutting production, but we didn't really hang on to that either. We got a little pop when the debt ceiling was raised, didn't really hang on to that either. Energy stocks have had sort of a similar experience, despite the fact, and I put this in the blog, that buybacks are still high, dividends are still high. So from a shareholder friendly and returning cash to shareholders perspective, energy stocks should look attractive compared to a lot of other sectors, but they just can't quite hold on to a bid. So the piece was about there's got to be something else at play. There's got to be another force at play. And the only thing that I can come up with is that investors are just not sold yet that there isn't an economic contraction coming. It's possible that if there isn't one, maybe then energy finds its upside. But there's still obviously concern about demand softening, continuing to soften, and that this sector just can't really get 
out of the way of that. Until we clear that uncertainty, I think, again, this is another one of those things that we're stuck in. We're stuck in kind of a range, and you're probably not going to make a ton of money until things change. All right. So if we could throw up a long-term OIH chart, go back maybe four or five years. And as we pull that chart up, I'm going to say a couple things. So the title of this piece was Low Battery. So when we used to play our little handheld games, they required those, what are those square batteries? Like, I don't even know what the hell they go. The ones that if you put it's it a, on your tongue. If you lick it, it, it shocks yeah. you. Don't yeah. lick them. Don't, don't do that. Well, I did. You know, you, you get dared as a kid to do Nine, something, A battery, right? A battery, but, isn't it? A, no, whatever it is. But anyway. I think people know the square ones as opposed to the round ones that we all know as well. But you need no, 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 those it's not things. It's not an A. The square. No, yeah. let's get. To, I said nine volt. I think it's a C battery. I think there's C right, Somebody in the comments. C's are the, C's are the, C's are the uh, big C's ones. C's are the it's big a ones. Nine volt. Nobody, nine volt. Okay. Anyway, so when our little like Coleco football game where you, had, you know, you made the. When it was on low battery, what what'd you do? Well, you went to the smoke detector and you pulled it out of there because, you you know, you would. You would sacrifice, you would risk having a fire in your house that we're not aware of so you could play your game. So I'm very well uh, well written and well versed in low battery, number one. Number two, pull up that OIH chart because this is anything but a bit of a low battery. If you look at this chart from early uh, 2020, you know what? That's a pretty good looking uptrend. Now, albeit not a steep one, but a series of higher highs, a series of higher lows. I think we just did exactly the same. The OIH is telling a bit of a story here. Now, the commodity, the underlying commodity seems to be vacillating between 68 and 75. We can't get our own way. But these equities, I think, have some giddy up left in them. So I'm not ready to pull Dan the ripcord yet on energy. And as you know, Dan, one of the O's in my mojo trade, and I'm not sure which one it is, is in fact OIH. Back to you. I know, but I guess if you're in the earnings recession camp, there's the, like, like to have a reacceleration in large cap, you know, integrated oil stocks or or drillers. You know, you're going to need a different sort of economy that All doesn't fair. line up. You know, so that that's the that's the one area. I just feel like we're at a point where there's been so much disregard for valuation this year after a very heightened sense of valuation last year. I think there also tends to be the the like 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 the propensity for people to move into value traps you know what i mean like so like like on the cheap side liz so i'm just curious like how you think about that like again you know like there was no care for valuation in 2020 and 2021 then as soon as the fed indicated that they're going to raise interest rates um there was lots of cares and we saw the sort of epic declines on on many widely owned names that you could only if you had been in the markets for 25 years you got to go back to the dot com implosion and then you'd have to go back to the financial crisis where lots of widely owned bank stocks you know what i mean lost 70 80 percent of their value and we had that last year so when mm -hmm. i think about 2023 and i think about again going back to this concentration going back to the disregard for some trillion dollar you know uh, market cap companies right and the valuations there i just think that a lot of folks and it might be what exactly what played out in in small caps you know over the last week or so there's there, there are value traps out there yeah there absolutely are it, so the valuation thing you're right and and look we have to acknowledge that 2022 did have a bit of a re-rating for everything right we re-rated because of what was happening with the fed because of what was happening with inflation because of where yields were going and that is how it's supposed to work in 2023 the environment hasn't really changed and that's i think what makes me not get on this bull parade and not get excited about valuations because the environment still hasn't changed so it's okay to pay less attention to valuations if the environment is supportive of it and what i mean by that is if if liquidity is increasing if rates are falling right that's supportive of higher valuations all we've seen in 2023 is rates continue to go up. The Fed continue to raise rates despite a regional bank crisis and yields kind of stay sticky, if not rise over the last few months. So the environment is just not supportive of high valuations being able to maintain that level. The other thing is the divergence, I think. And maybe that's part of what's happened over the last few days is this big divergence among you know the big high valuation names and then basically the rest of the index. So if you've got an algorithm or you've got triggers that you're looking at 
a lot of stuff looks pretty opportunistic right now, especially compared to stuff in your portfolio that's high valuation. So, and think about it from a buying and selling perspective. If you're holding a portfolio, whether you're a portfolio manager running a fund or you're just running your personal account, if something happens and you get nervous, the easiest stuff to sell is the biggest, most liquid stuff that you probably have the biggest gains in because you're not regretting selling that. The easiest stuff to buy is the stuff that looks comparatively cheap, which is where you get stuck in that value trap. And the question that you always have to ask yourself is, is this stuff cheap for a reason? And I would argue there are still a number of names, a number of sectors that are cheap for a reason if we're worried about a recession. Now, can they get that much cheaper? Maybe not. So is this a time that you could start thinking about dripping into cyclicals? Yeah, I do think that this is a time you can think about that. But don't plow everything into it and don't do it with the expectation that they won't go down again first, right? So you have to think about that from a valuation perspective, from a cash flow perspective. And I would be buying shareholder friendly companies right now. I'd be looking at the stuff that's still offering a dividend, the stuff that's maybe engaging in buybacks. Yeah. All right. Let's let's hit one single name before we get to our main man butters. Um, so this is DocuSign guy. They report after the close tonight. Okay. This is like a $12 billion market cap company. The implied move in either direction is 14%. The stock's up nearly 50% from its 52 week lows made in November. Okay. You see the stock has rallied um, a little bit just in the last uh, month or so. It was trading $47. Now it's trading um, $58. This is a company that has, um, we all know what they do. You guys probably signed a hundred documents over the pandemic and probably still are. I mean, that behavior was pretty sticky. This is a great product offering, right? But it's a company that trades um, on adjusted earnings about 60 times, four and a half times um, sales. Like I said, it's got a $12 billion uh, market cap. They have you know, $2.7 billion in sales. The problem is the sales growth has decelerated massively. It's probably mid to high single digits. And on an adjusted basis, yes, they make money. On a gap basis, they're basically break even. So, Guy, my question to you here is that, okay, here's a stock. Maybe it has an AI moment. I'm not so sure. I don't know what the hell you could do with something like this here. Um, But you have, uh, you know, a mid single digit Mm -hmm. You know, earnings and sales name trading, you know, like at, at expensive multiples, not that profitable. Again, what, what do you do with a company like this after that whole context that we just gave? It is down 87%. This would be like, you know, in late 02, early 03, buying Yahoo or buying Qualcomm or buying, you know what I mean? That, that sort of thing. Because when you think about like just the, the decimation, um, these are hard names. They're good trading stocks, but look at that gap back in March, you know, that it had or whatever. That was, a, I think, a, a, a negative pre-announcement. So, you know, there's risk to just trying to bottom fish some of this stuff. I agree. So put up that prior chart real quick, yeah. because I think trying to play it ahead of this release is probably a coin flip at best. So here's how I would look at this quickly. So you mentioned a 14% move. It's roughly... I don't know, let's call it um, a nine-ish dollar move. Is that accurate, right? I mean, ish from where we are now. Yeah. So the bounce to the upside potentially could take us to those February highs where I think then you look to fade it and probably put on a short position. A miss will take us down to effectively close to, not entirely to, that trend line, which comes right in, you know, you've drawn the line. So There's an opportunity, I think, to, on a miss, buy it for a trade. And if, in fact, they say something that the market likes, lay into this thing on the short side. Because right here, I think you're flipping coins, Dan. But I will say this. This is another one of those vaunted Kathy Woods names that has been grim death now for quite some time. Yeah. And one thing I'd say about a company like this is that they do one thing really well, you know, and and if they are. So do I. But I don't trade at a premium valuation. That's right. Back to you. So I guess my point is, is like there is strategic. This is a company that if they were to disappoint and give negative guidance and stock has goes back into the 40s. okay. and if you put the five year chart up, they got a good balance sheet. Like there's no issues as far as liquidity, all this sort of stuff. This could be a strategic um, acquisition target. It yeah. could be a private equity company wants to cut a bunch of costs and, you know, like that sort of thing. So, again, you don't have to be a hero in front of this thing unless you have a strong inclination. So I just wanted to highlight that name because I think on a daily basis, we're getting lots of interesting examples of like what it feels like to try to buy something that's down 90 percent that doesn't really have value. Right. You know what I mean? From from a traditional standpoint um, and some of the things that have been down 
killed this much. They can get killed. They can drop another 50% or something like that. So um, just wanted to hit that. All right, this is the time. Right, hold on. I love yeah. this comment because why not? JS says, guys, PE is off the chart. He rocks. Fucking A. Back to you, Dan. <laughs> All right. By the way, uh, for, you, for those that wonder he's where that F-bombs. came from, um, fucking A came from, if you remember the movie, The Deer Hunter. That was said number of times during the deer hunter, and the A was short for Axel. In case anybody cares, great movie, long oh, yeah. movie. But that's when Meryl Streep, boy, I'm off. This is, by the way, you wanted the radio show. This is it. Meryl Streep m- met John Cazale on that movie, and they fell in love. Now, obviously, he uh-huh. was in Dan, as Our you know, afternoon. he was in that five movies. One, All were just ridiculous movies. The ones that people forget, of course, would be, I think, the conversation. Um, Dog Day Afternoon, you mentioned okay. Deer Hunter, both Godfathers. So back to you. Deer, Deer uh, Hunter is a tough watch. Man. No, it's not. It, it is long. No, it's not. It is depressing. It's a brilliant it is... movie. Okay. Well, we'll no, see. it's mm-hmm. genius. I think that's a movie you want to, on a rainy day, like some random rainy, like Saturday, put on the Deer Hunter. That's, yeah, just, that's introspective just as hell. All sharp objects away from your your viewing area. Um, I would just say, Liz, don't don't if it's gonna rain this weekend out there, you know, at the beach, don't don't put that one in it. All right, let's. Sorry. I don't I don't plan on it. Yeah, <laughs> all right. she's never people. seen it. By the way, people, time. I want to see all the comments. What are we looking for here, people? What is our hashtag on a Thursday? That's what I'm talking about, Dan. Now I'm gonna stop talking now because Dan's gonna introduce this because now we clip it. And I don't want to screw up the clip, Dan. I mean, you know, I, I don't know how we avoid that at this point, guy. All right. This is the time we do hashtag butters. It's John Butters. He's the senior earnings insight analyst over there at FactSet. He drops his email, his blog um, every Friday morning, but we get a preview it on the Thursday market call. So today, this one's actually kind of fitting about some of the stuff that we've just been discussing. He's looking at S&P 500 earnings, which are expected to decline 6.4% for Q2. Okay, we are about to end Q2, but they predict earnings growth of 8.2% for Q4. Guy, we've been talking about the back half loaded scenario all year. John Butters has been reminding us of that. The communication services and technology sectors are expected to be the largest contributors to earnings growth for Q4, excluding those two sectors. The estimated earnings growth rate for Q4 for the S&P 500 falls to 3.9% from 8.2. Liz, talk to us a little about that. Do you like excluding two sectors, okay, from the overall picture here? But it is important, and this goes back to last year at this time, Mr. Butters, or into year end of 2022, he was reminding us that despite tech and the fall off that we had in earnings and it was being helped a great deal by energy earnings last year they're going to fall off this year we've seen that and so to Mm -hmm. me this really speaks to some of the rotations we were also talking about how are you thinking about first half versus second half and the different makeup of s p 500 earnings first of all i don't like excluding things from analysis period because i think it allows you to cherry pick to some degree, which is why I've had such a bone to pick with the Fed about this super core measure of CPI, because you just take everything out that's problematic. And yeah, it's going to look okay. Anyway, when you look at earnings, if you take out the two sectors that make up most of the index at a time when most investors own broad S&P ETFs, ah, I don't know that that's really as useful. So I wouldn't want to take them out. I think it's important to look at it from a perspective of how narrow is the earnings leadership, how narrow is the earnings strength. And it's something that you keep in the back of your mind as what is this market actually held up by? As far as expecting over 8% growth in Q4, okay, perhaps, right? But that's all still assuming that we're sort of flat year over year, 2023 versus 2022. I continue to think that that probably is not likely. I think there's probably going to be a bit of a rude awakening still with profit margins. And we're probably going to hear about that in the second quarter, maybe the third quarter, depending on how long this takes. So I'm not as optimistic that earnings will come in that way in Q4. That said, I was not optimistic about Q1 earnings and ended up being wrong. So companies have I will admit companies have managed these operating margins better than I expected so far. They've cut costs enough, it seems like, to maintain and pad their profit margins to this point, and revenue has sort of kept up. But one of the things that I know I've warned about, I know Guy has warned about, that we wish for inflation to come down. Remember that as inflation comes down, 
so does revenue mm-hmm. and the top line. So as long as they've managed their costs throughout, things will be okay. It's rare, if not nearly impossible for companies to be able to manage that perfectly. Yeah. Dan, before we go to the next slide real quick, the things that stick out to me like a bit of a sore thumb is consumer discretionary, 21.3%. I mean, I, I believe that's going to be wishful thinking given what I think is going to happen to the consumer. And financials up 11.4%. Financials are going to be challenged at best in this environment. So I would look at those two as sort of the outliers, Dan. Yeah, no, and, th- and that makes sense. And, and, and as, as it relates to like excluding data, I actually find it really interesting. I don't make investment decisions on it, but I do think it kind of highlights, you know, certain concentrations, certain reliance on different sectors. So to me, I do find it interesting um, to see that sort of data. Um, and, and I love this slide. At the company level, Amazon, Meta, Google, and NVIDIA are expected to be the largest contributors to earnings growth for Q4, excluding these four companies and the estimated earnings growth rate for Q4 for the S&P 500 falls to 4.3% from 8.2%. I do find this interesting, Guy. And so one, one of the reasons we've spent a lot of time on NVIDIA in particular over the last few weeks since they gave that guidance for the current quarter is that it was such a huge beat, right? And so when you think about that, for them to keep up that level of beat, they might have pulled forward some of that revenue that might have been expected into late this year, into Q4. So I wonder, right, what that is discounting. And that's how we started the show talking about that. Now, you could come back to me and say, well, when Q4 2023 estimates were set by analysts and the consensus was, you know, uh, kind of arrived at, let's say, earlier this year, a lot of this hype around their H100 chips, you know, for the demand for all of these, um, you know, supercomputers that are going into these data centers that are going to support these AI processes, that wasn't even in the conversation. Um, Well, I'd say their ability to maintain this pace of outperformance is not particularly great. So you might have pulled forward some of that second half loaded um, excitement. And that's why the NASDAQ on this parabolic move of late makes me a little bit nervous if you're buying into it because you think Q4 is going to kind of sustain this level of um, price appreciation in the stocks. We talked about this. You talked about it on OK Computer. I know we talked about it on Market Call. I know we talked about it on the tape, but I encourage people to go to their Google machines and look up what Scott McNeely said nearly 23 years ago about the potential and the math associated with Sun Microsystems continuing to grow at their pace. It was unsustainable, and he put it out there on math, and I think you bring up a good point when we're talking about NVIDIA. And last I looked, semiconductors are still, Dan, an extraordinarily cyclical uh, industry. Back to you. All right. Well, that's it, man. We, that's it? we got, we, well, that's it. I mean, we, we kind of risked. Twin on- Bill in the Bronx today, folks. Um, letting you know they got smoked out yesterday. I've never said that before in my life, <laughs> uh, not being a smoker. Big game tonight in Atlanta for the Mets, having dropped two to the Braves, the Mets find themselves a 30 and 32. So in order for them, Liz, to win 100 games, they have to play at a 700 clip. They have to go 70 mm. and 30 in the final 100. I don't see that happening, but I'm it's a, a hater, ass. as you know. Mm-hmm. You're going to say something about the Brewers? Because they've they've been pedestrian over the last month or so. Yeah, yeah. we can't get the bats going. We get, yeah. You know, it's hard to win games without the bats. So they are not anyway. they are not this generation's wait for it, Dan. Harvey wall bangers. I would encourage you folks you know to look at that. I thought you were gonna bring them up. I actually I made a bet with the team before you came on last week. I thought Harlem Globetrotters, and if you kept going, I'd we hear about Harvey's wall bangers, well, but here, it's it's it this now. week. It's this yeah. week. I was just well, I don't early. want to be, you know, I find myself um predictable only in my unpredictability, Dan Nathan. See what I did there? <laughs> Matter of fact. Um, all right, Liz, it's great to see you on a Thursday market call, as we always do. You will be back with Guy and me on Monday for our Monday edition of On the Tape. Monday's going to be busy as shit, man. Monday's going to be fun. And, and we're trying to work through. We're, we're really, listen, this market call is meant to be very visual. That's why we spend a lot of time on charts. We kind of work through, like, Liz's notes, that sort of thing, right? On On the Tape, it's a very audio-centric you know, uh, format. The market call on Sirius is going to be a call in sort of thing. So we're trying to, you know, we're going to meet you where you are. We're going to give you the content that you want on different days at different times. That sort of thing. Is that, is that fair guy? Is that fair? And then I'm going to, you know, I'm going to channel a lot of different things on Monday. Uh, You know, I'm just telling you, just get out. I'm just telling you people now. Watch out. 
Am I going to be not? Maybe. Yeah. Yeah, maybe. I mean, okay. may I don't know. I pretty probably yes because I'm going to have to do CNBC's Fast Money, which I wear a tie for. So yeah. I will be wearing my tie. Yeah, and we hope not that, that we'll matters. Be us in the radio studio uh, on some Mondays here when she, Elizabeth uh, will be there for yeah. sure, man. We're gonna rock it. I love, I love a radio. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love a radio okay. show. All right. Well, on well, that note, okay. That's it, peeps. Listen, I want to thank Elizabeth Young. You know her as EY from SoFi. We've made that. I mean, we've think about what we've done on that front. I mean, people stop her in the streets of Manhattan and say, "Wait a second, <laughs> you're that EY from SoFi." person she's like yeah as a matter of fact i am number mm. one number two butters i mean seriously i mean right butters is we have he's transcended everything that would be of course john butters a fact set i want to thank the audience always here with us jacob steven amanda and the interns back at the home fort which is dan's at right now i want to thank fact set financial data and analytics powered by tomorrow so far, dan get your money right all in one app <sighs> Enjoy the games in the Bronx today. I hope the Yankees sweep as I typically do. Mets in Atlanta tonight. I think we got some hockey. That's it. And you know what? The Heat did not look like a team that was prepared last night for what the Denver Nuggets were bringing. Got to go. Got to record some serious spots. And if I keep talking, I'm not going to be able to do it. See you later, people. See you later. <laughs>